Well, hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to Digging Deeper. Uh, we have Tawny here, and we also have first time, first time caller, long time listener, <laughs> Doug Hagera, one of our counselors and my predecessor at the Redwood campus. So uh, we are uh, so excited, Doug and, and uh, Tawny, for you guys being here uh, on, on Digging Deeper. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting us. Totally. Well, before we dive into today's text, uh, I think it would just be remiss of us not to bring up a little bit of what's going on uh, in our country right now. It's obvious that we're really hurting as a country. And, you know, just, I guess, what are you guys' preliminary thoughts on um, how Romans 8 might speak to our current crisis? Uh, what are some things that are coming to your mind? Uh, other scriptures coming to your mind about um, just how we as Christians should be thinking about this current moment. Mm -hmm. You can go first, Tony. Um, well, if you have a verse for us, you could give it to well, us. Well, I've got a couple of verses. So, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I think of, I think of Psalm two, well, you know, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Uh, the Kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed, you know, let us throw off their fetters. I think we're watching some of that, but uh, the the verse that came to mind I've been thinking about for a while, and maybe it's not a, a Romans 8, um, but it's uh, when a sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, uh, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong, uh, Ecclesiastes Whoa. 11. Yeah, and uh, so we've seen a lot of injustice, and it seems like people are getting away with it, and it feels like the people are casting off restraints, and uh, we're watching that with uh, the riots, certainly. Mm. But uh, in regards to the the Romans eight, and you know what what beautiful thing could God bring out of something so ugly? Uh, you know, it's uh, Ephesians one eleven says He's a God who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of His will. And so mm. uh, we may not see it as something beautiful, but it certainly is something that uh, fits with His overall plan. And I, I feel like I can rest in that. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the Romans 8 kind of, uh, Romans eight twenty eight. you know, God causes all things. And, uh, you know, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So certainly it's been a wake up call for believers. I feel that that certainly would be something we should lean into. Totally. How do we do this, Lord? I've been reminded of James, almost the whole book. I just think the whole book is always so relevant to any culture, any time period. And there's so many things, right? Uh, we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Um, mm -hmm. It also talks about don't just listen to the word, but do what it says. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about favoritism and prejudice in chapter two. Uh, faith without works is dead. Uh, wisdom from above in chapter three that the wisdom that's peaceable and and uh and then you know chapter five warning on rich oppressors uh and also the need for prayer so i'm just amazed at how james always speaks into our current uh situation tawny you were mentioning off air just some of the discouragement that you've seen on, on social media i think we can all relate to that uh or some of your thoughts to this question well i mean like what both of you guys are alluding to it as believers we have to think differently about this stuff like um we can't just get caught up in our emotions there's there's so many emotions and there's so much hurt in all the different sides of this and um on facebook last night there were some people from my old church we all went to church together and they were just tearing each other to shreds Mm. over the opposing you know views and i was just sitting there crying because we're brothers and sisters in christ and john 17 is probably my favorite chapter in the bible and it shows how important us loving each other is and i mean and not just loving each other as christians but loving our you know brothers and sisters of color and standing up for them but also caring about our communities like we have to put love first and and not get caught up in the in our in our minds and our ideas and just make sure our hearts are staying soft and really being for for everybody instead of against against each other you know it just it's so sad that we're Definitely. all hurting so in so many different ways you know 
Mm-hmm. I think everyone should have to read James 1, 19 through 21 every time before they post, you know, on social media. <laughs> they, they should read it five times out loud or write it on the chalkboard, you know? <laughs> um, yes. But, uh, you know, one, one more note on this. Uh, like Doug mentioned that the aspect of riots and chaos and, and some of that kind of Psalm 2 um, perspective. And I, I, I could totally see that. I also thought it was interesting. So I went to the, the protest, very peaceful protest at the courthouse yesterday. And I think if you were an anthropologist, if you were someone who studies humanity and you were there the other day, you would say, you know, it looks like these people are very religious. And uh, I mean that, you know, uh, in some ways very positively. I mean, there were people singing and praying, kneeling, Mm -hmm. uh, liturgical Mm -hmm. call and response, uh, chants, signs, arms raised. And uh, so I was really uh, struck by that, that. I don't think most people are, you know, militant atheists. I think that we all have this hunger and this stirring inside of us. And uh, what yeah. if we as the church can can speak into that? Uh, and, you know, I think God's always at work. So those are just a few things bouncing around in my head right now. Very good. But, well, guys, uh, Romans 8.28. I think it's probably the second most popular verse in the Bible after John 3.16. And... As I was studying this passage, I thought a lot about the idea of a cliche. You got, I mean, a cliche would be, uh, let's get a dictionary definition here, uh, a phrase or opinion that is overused and betrays a lack of original thought. And, you know, what's unfortunate about some of the best verses in the Bible is that they're the best, so they're the most familiar, most repeated, and then we get kind of bored, things get stale, very familiar, um, and, we, and it becomes a cliche an overused phrase that we don't really think about. Um, You guys have both been Christians for a long time. How have you guys dealt with, you know, some of our beloved verses or concepts or ideas in Christianity getting very familiar and and stale? Now, you want to go first, Tawny? Sure. Well, this this one's pretty quick for me. I just try to live them out. Mm. Like, that's what keeps them fresh for me. Like, okay, I, I know this, but can I live it out? Do I walk in it? Do I believe it? And that, that's what keeps those things fresh for me. Mm-hmm. Good word. Um, I, I've actually developed the 67th book of the Bible. It's called First Opinions. And <laughs> it's, it's based on just much of its cliches. It uh, uh, runs with run, people running with partial truths, um, the a common one is um, God won't give us more than we can handle, and it's it's basically a, a poor interpretation of First Corinthians ten thirteen, uh, you know, which talks about God will give a way of escape in the midst of a temptation, um, but He definitely gives us more than we can handle. Uh, I mean, Paul talked about that in Second Corinthians one nine, where he said, you know, we felt the sentence of death, but these things happen to us so that we would not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And so the, the need to know that we're, we're going to have to learn endurance uh, is, um, you know, is God does give us more than we can handle so that we rely on him. But some of the other ones would be God who helps those who help themselves and right. time heals all wounds and, and uh, not uncommon that those, um, those come out. Uh, one of the things that came to mind um, uh, in this was uh, uh, the um, the refusal to look at secondary causes. You know that there was that was one of the things that struck me with Romans eight twenty eight is the saints of old would uh, they said no and god causes that they learned to accept everything that came their way as having come through uh the their loving heavenly father's hands uh that it wasn't just random acts of Mm. of, you know that it, it hit it came through his hands and so you know god how how do you want me to handle this you know what 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 am i supposed to learn um you know and as opposed to uh, just uh, dealing with the the hands that it came through, the human hands. And we'll come back to this on one of the, the final thoughts, but it, it just was that. I like that refusal to look at secondary causes. Mm. Yeah, I think for me, 
you know, growing up in the church, uh, when I come to familiar passages or topics, uh, I try to do a couple of things. One, read some different translations to kind of freshen things up, um, meditate on it, repeat it over and over again, uh, put the promise in my own words, mm -hmm. to kind of internalize it, like Tawny said, um, to, to apply it to my life and pray the promises, <clears throat> um, to talk about it, like what we're doing right now. Uh, and then for me and you, you two as well, you guys are both readers. Uh, reading is really important for me. Uh, it might be reading the entire chapter. So instead of just taking Romans 8, 28, read Romans 8 in entire, the entirety of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of John three sixteen, read the whole thing of John 3 yes. or Jeremiah 29. Um, and that's been helpful. And then, of course, uh, study Bibles and commentaries. Uh, if you don't have a study Bible, I would recommend, uh, you know, contact me. I'd love to. Uh, mm -hmm. get put, point you in the right direction for that. But I think that's kind of the whole idea behind digging deeper too. What we're doing here is that we're taking the, the cliche and really unpacking it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, I mean, so actually digging in deeper to this passage, one thing that I noticed is in Romans 8, 28, um, there's a little bit of ambiguity in the text as to who the subject is of the all things. So for example, uh, in the NIV, it says, in all things, God works together for the good. But the ESV says, all things work together for good. And then there's kind of a third option. So either that all things are the subject, God is the subject, or uh, some see the Holy Spirit as the subject. So in all things, the Holy Spirit works for the good of those who love God. Uh, have any of you done any research on um, which one textually we think uh, – it is, or uh, does it does it really matter? I, I feel like it, the main thing is God works, you know, in in the midst of the all things, um, and so I don't know that it, it's tremendously important what we find as the main subject because it, sure. it does seem as if the goal, the cons, everything is conspiring. It's the following verse that to be so that we be conformed to the image of Christ, to yeah, the image yeah. of his son. So it seems like um, that's what the all things are conspiring to do. Sure. Well, and have you guys ever done that exercise where you take a verse and like focus on one word the yeah. most and go through it different ways? Mm -hmm. I feel like depending on the situation, we would focus on that verse differently, like all things or mm -hmm. you know, God through the Holy Spirit. You know, it would just kind of depend on what we were going through sometimes as well. <laughs> Amen. That's, yeah, that's true. And, and Doug's right. I mean, theologically, this question um, is not necessarily important because all of them are true. All things, God, Holy Spirit. Uh, textually, I think it's interesting to think of, you know, because verse 27 talks about how the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And then verse 28, all things, you know, in all things, God works for the good. So I, I think one way of redeeming the cliche out of removing the familiarity is to think about the Holy Spirit's role in this promise that he is at work making all things, uh, working all things together for good. And, you know, it's just an interesting, um, another way to look at it, I guess. Yes. But if you think about Daniel, at one point, you know, God sent Michael to help him work his stuff out for good. Ooh, so, yeah. you know, that's fun to think about, too. Like, God can use different things and different means to work it all out for good. Well, that's a great segue, too, into the idea of the roots of this promise. So, Paul doesn't pull this promise out of thin air. He actually gets it from the Old Testament. Uh, we were... Uh, I talked about that briefly in the weekend service, um, and, and I, I argued primarily the story of Joseph. Uh, what do you guys like most about the Joseph story? Mm, it just his his perspective that uh, one that he did say, you know, you meant it to harm me. I'm so glad he didn't go. Oh, you guys didn't really mean it. Uh, I that yes. you know. Because we do that a lot. We go, oh, you, you didn't mean it. No, they really did mean it. They meant to harm him. And, uh, and yet God still used their intended harm to bring about something incredible, um, as he often does. Good point. And I think for me, what I like about that story is 
when things go sideways, a lot of times we're tempted to try and figure out what we did wrong. Mm. But other than bragging to his brothers, which was not very smart, Joseph didn't really do anything wrong. He did. He had integrity. He was putting God first. He was living a righteous life and things still went sideways. But in the end, he could see how God worked it all together. So, so it just, um, it's just reassuring that God's doing something bigger with our life than we can see. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your Piper quote was, was very good in the message. The, Thanks, what was it? 10,000 10, things God is up to and you're aware of three of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that was good. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I, I'm impressed with Joseph in that he doesn't, it, not that we know of, I guess we don't have any information on this, but it doesn't seem like he ever gets any information from God. No angels show up. Um, no, no words from the Lord other than a couple dreams. And, I mean, he, he doesn't even have a Bible. He doesn't have anything except, you know, just one or two dreams from the Lord. And he clings to, to God's word as it says, I don't remember the Psalm, but it says that jo Joseph you know, clings to that. And so that really impresses me that he hardly had anything, but he, what he did have, he, he clung to with uh, God's promises. Yes. What are, what are some other Old Testament characters? I mean, Tawny, you brought up Daniel. Uh, any other Old Testament characters that kind of rattle around in your guys' brains as you think of the Romans 828 promise? Well, uh, I think of, um, I was pondering this and I think of, of, Israel in Egypt and, uh, you know, little uh, embryo, 70, you know, a nation with a um, nation of 70 with a lot of sheep and cattle. Uh, they would have been easy targets for some marauding band of, you know, coming through, uh, not much of an army that they could present at that point. And yet, you know, God plants them in the womb of Egypt. They grow to be, you know, two and a half to three million people. Uh, and, and then, you know, the God uses that to, to basically bring Egypt to its knees so that, you know, it doesn't pose a, a, a threat. In fact, I'm not sure it ever posed a threat after that, uh, to Egypt, uh, I mean, to Israel. Mm. So that was one that came to mind. Interesting. How about you, Tani? Yeah. I, well, I thought about Abigail. I should have went and read the story again, but you know, she's got a horrible husband and has to intervene. And, you know, does she save David's life or her husband's life? Her no, loser either. husband. Yeah, yeah. But then she's faithful to God and she gets to end up yeah. marrying David, which would be cool if she was his only, you know, better if it's his only wife. But, but still, <laughs> she's a neat lady. I look forward to meeting her in heaven. And she just seems really smart, but had integrity and, and did what God wanted her to do. And she, uh, it worked out for good. Mm. Yes. Oh. It's interesting. The examples that came to my mind were also women, uh, Esther and Ruth. Uh, Esther in particular, because in the whole book, God is not mentioned explicitly once, which some people like the Old Testament um, <clears throat> scribes, they, they didn't really like that about Esther, that God's not mentioned. But it's very obvious that his fingerprints are all over the book as he orchestrates the, the story and works all things for good even for a compromised person like Esther. So, mm. <clears throat> well, guys, um, here, here, here's where we get down to the nitty gritty, okay? Uh, <laughs> the controversial P word, predestination. Uh, it's actually a biblical word. We can't avoid it or hide from it. Uh, and, you know, one, one thing I'll note here at River Valley, um, this is not an issue that we divide over. Uh, we have pastors here that are all over, pastors and, uh, and staff that are all over the map, the map on maybe more predestination, Calvinistic-y, deterministic, and then on the other side, more the free will, uh, personal responsibility. And we've just, as a church, decided we're not going to divide over this issue, that um, we're going to, um, you know, not make this a first-rate issue. You know, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. That's very important to us. Uh, baptism very important to us. Um, this issue not not a lot not on those lines, um, yeah. and so I think that's important to to start with is that we're we're not going to take a very uh, strong stance on this. Um, but you know, kind of as we think through this, um, how have you guys thought through the idea of predestination? What do you think Paul has in mind here? 
Well, whenever I see it mentioned in scripture, it always is in the context of, of salvation uh, and sanctification. It's not in the context of, of judgment and hell. Mm. Uh, and so I think that helps me that, uh, you know, God has, um, I, I guess uh, it was a former missionary, Dick Hillis, who said, you know, all people are precious. You know, God does not will that any should perish. All people are precious, but but only a few, only some are strategic. And, um, and I think about like, even in my own uh, immediate family, extended family, you know, I was the first believer in my family. And uh, so was his call upon my life strategic, you know, so that I have a responsibility, mm. you know, to, uh, to my immediate family and extended family. Um, and, you know, I've leaned into it in that manner uh, and say, okay, you know, but whosoever will may come. And so, you know, that's, we never want to lose that, yes. you know, to determine that, you know, well, God already knows who's going to be. Well, yeah, he's, he's all knowing, you know, but we still got to live it through yes. and live it yes. out. And I, I'm not going to lie. This is way above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> For me, predestination is just something kind of like in times theology where I'm like, I don't understand this at all, Lord. I'm just going to obey you every day and trust you're going to work it out. But I do like when I pray for people, the, the only way I see it seep into anything is sometimes I'll be like, Lord, if you haven't chosen them yet, choose them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just choose yeah. them. And, but I mean, he's created all of us. He's created the whole world. He's created salvation. He's great. I mean, he, he's the author and finisher of this story and of our faith. So he's so involved in all of it. And we can just we can just trust that it's good and it's right, even the things we can't quite wrap our mind around. Yeah, no, that's good, Tony. I had a Bible professor, my favorite one, Dr. Lyons, and uh, you know he's probably not watching, but shout out to Dr. Lyons. He really helped me think through this by um, the the metaphor of juggling. So, can either of you guys juggle? Yes. Doug, I, I was a children's pastor for many years, so <laughs> hey, I learned how to there juggle. We go. Yeah. on a unicycle. Yeah. No. Um, no. So the idea of juggling is that it only works if all the balls are moving at the same time. And I think with this idea, this topic, we have to hold three truths in tension. We have to juggle three truths. So the first one, God is totally sovereign. He's in control of even human decisions. Well, we saw that in the Joseph story. Nothing is outside of his control. Two, humans are responsible, moral creatures. Uh, we can't say God made me do it. We can't say Satan made me do it. Uh, we have a responsibility to live and act in a certain way. And three, the third thing we're juggling is that God is not the author of sin. Uh, mm -hmm. God doesn't create sin. He doesn't, uh, again, he doesn't make us do sin. Um, we are responsible for sin. And so if you can keep those three balls spinning, if you can keep those three tr truths in tension, I think you're going to be in a good place. Uh, if you emphasize only one over and against the other ones, I think you get into weird territory or even like false religions um, or cults. And so mm -hmm. those those three things are the things that I try and keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, and we definitely have, I mean, the Bible makes it clear we have free will as well. So that's like you're saying, that's what, trying mm -hmm. to keep those two things in mind at the same time. I I just... Once I had kids, I wished there was no such thing as free will. <laughs> God, just make them do it. But <laughs> he knows yeah. what he's doing. So, One more thing I'll note on predestination before we move on is that uh, I think a lot of times we view this under the, the lens of individualism. So we just think of like God choosing individuals over and against other ones. And I don't know that that's always the most helpful way to look at it. I do believe God chooses individuals. He had to choose Tyler Goins, Doug Aguera. Tawny, Tawny Moore? Wait, what? I totally forgot your last name, Tawny. Oh, well. Uh, but I think in scripture, predestination is almost always talked about corporately too, right? He chooses a people. He chooses the church. He, he chooses us as a family. And so I think that aspect is often missed in as we're like, oh, like has God chosen me? Has God, God chosen her or him? Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to have a group corporate perspective a lot of times as we think of, of this area. Um, 
Another idea of predestination, verse 29 says that we were predestined to be conformed to Christ's image. Uh, this is a really massive and powerful idea. Um, what does this mean for you guys, this idea of being conformed, transformed to look like Christ? What comes to mind? Oh, you go that's, first, one of my, that's one of my favorite things about just being God's child is that well, he wants to share such amazing things with us. And one of them being making us like Jesus. I mean, that's so amazing that he wants to shape our character so that we don't just follow Jesus. We become like Jesus. And, and it's so much more solid than just talking about it when we actually are being transformed and changing. I love that. Hmm. That's good. How about you, Doug? You're in the counseling office a lot. You, you see this firsthand. <laughs> well, well, for me, it's, it's kind of, I go back to the garden and what was lost in the garden. Uh, you know, after God had created everything, his, his crowning creation was man. Let us make man in our image, in yeah. our likeness, and let them rule. And uh, so there, there's, you know, three different words there. Um, we don't need to go into, but uh, so uh, that we were created to be an extension of the life of God, an expression of his character. That's the difference in the words uh, for image and likeness. Uh, and then we were uh, uh, exhibits of his power. So what was lost in the fall? And uh, the, you can make the case in uh, Genesis 9-6 that man still retained the image. It mentions, in fact, I wrote it out here, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall, be, shall his blood be shed for in the image of God, God has made man. Yeah. Uh, and so the image was still present after the fall, but what was lost, we, we no longer had the ability to be an expression of his character. Mm. So... So when we come to Christ and he places a new nature inside of us, now we have the, the fruit of that nature is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's the, it's the nature of Christ. And uh, whereas we didn't have that uh, ability before. Um, so I think that the ability to get back to the original design and be an expression of the character is part of what's going on in New Testament Christianity. That's cool. It makes me think of the uh, metaphor. I heard one time a teacher talk about he bought one of those really old gas, um, what would you call like a, a the gas dispenser in a gas station? What would you call that? Just a, the, the, the pump? I mean, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. thank the you. The pump, duh. Um, they, they found one of those old ones and they started polishing it up and restoring it. And the son asked the dad, well, how do we know when it's done? How do we know when this is finished? And the dad said, when we can see our reflection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a cool image of being conformed to the image. And that is a painful process. I mean, grinding off all the rust and some of that stuff. Um, oops, getting a call here. Uh, I just think that's such a great image of, of yes. sanctification. The, the reflection of our maker. Amen. Totally. Yeah. Well, and it helps so much when we're going through hard times to remember that God's goal isn't for our pleasure or our comfort or our security. Like his goal is to make us like Jesus. So it just helps us um, focus on different things, knowing that that's what he cares about the most. Yeah. Yeah, back to the, the book of First Opinions. Uh, the First Opinions, chapter one, verse one, is God wants me to be happy. And, uh, and so, you know, it's like, oh, the, the byproduct of holiness is happiness. You know, when you're doing what you were originally designed to do, you go, oh, this, is, this feels right. Mm. Uh, yeah. That's good. Any thoughts on, so the idea of conform to Christ's image, obviously that word conformed is a, uh, a painful word sometimes. I mean, you just think of pottery or the yeah. refining of gold, some of these metaphors. Um, I, I used a couple examples of like mosaics, turning trash into treasure or painting or pottery. Um, any, any additional thoughts on, on that, on some of those images of uh, God, you know, the, the 10,000 things that God's doing? and weaving it into yes. some grand final product 
what comes to you guys' mind in that area? Yeah. There was a, a, a man who used to take uh, chunks of rock and he would sculpt them into these beautiful horses. And uh, somebody was watching him do this. And he says, man, that's amazing. How do, how do you do that? And he says, I just chip away at everything that doesn't look like a horse. And so when, when God takes the, you know, the rough product as we come to him, you know, outside of our, from our life of sin, and he begins to chip away, you know, he doesn't bring a memo, no memo comes, he just starts chipping away. And, uh, you know, our job is, is to cooperate and to understand, you know, that um, he's, he's at work conforming us to the image of his son. Mm. Tawny, you had the great uh, illustration of painting and the paintbrush. The Lord kind of brought something to your mind in that area. Uh, share with us some, some of that. Well, uh, I was just thinking that um, us being his masterpieces, that the, cir the circumstances are what he uses a lot of the time to shape us and conform us, but the circumstances are what we can see. Like they're right in front of our face. Whereas a lot of times we can't see what God is doing and we can't see what he's doing himself and we can't always see what he's doing in us. And we get so fixated on the circumstances because they're what we can see. And that's like being fixated on the paintbrush instead of the painter, mm. you know, or being fixated on the paintbrush rather than the masterpiece. And so just remembering that um, our circumstances are a small part of the equation rather than the biggest part was really helpful for me to think about. That's cool. No, I, I love that illustration. Uh, you know, the paintbrush is the thing that we're seeing the most because it's painful and it's right in our face and, you know, if we're the, the painting. But, uh, yeah, I like that idea of, you know, we, we don't get to see the final product until later. We'll see parts, but, uh, you know, the, the final glory that's going to be revealed will be uh, just so much better than we could think or even imagine. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, well, guys, any other thoughts about uh, we're, we're running to our uh, getting pretty close to 40 minutes. Any other thoughts about the weekend sermon, the uh, Romans chapter eight, the formation journey? Uh, well, I would go back to that refusal to look at secondary causes. You know, uh, the uh, when uh, Jesus was in the garden and he was being arrested and Peter put this pulled the sword out and began to swing Jesus said, Peter, put the sword away. The Father's cup, shall I not drink it? And uh, the Father's cup had a lot of human handprints on it. It mm -hmm. had uh, Judas's, it had Pilate's, it had Herod's, it had Annas and Caiaphas and uh, Jewish leaders. And, um, and, but he, he only saw the Father's cup. And that would be my, my challenge to the listeners is, um, you know, let go of the sword. And, uh, okay, Father, you know, what am I failing to learn uh, through the hardship that I've lived through either now or in the past? Uh, maybe you didn't see the handprint of God and see that, um, you know, the, like the saints of old again, let us drink from the cup that the Father's hand has mixed. And so to, you know, recognize that uh, he is working to conform you to the image of his son. Good word. Yeah, and during these times, I mean, some of us, a lot of us probably are experiencing things we never have before between the virus and the lockdown and now um, all the violence and the injustice and the protests and everything. And there's, there's so many circumstances maybe that we've never faced before and to just really cry out to God. Like if we're feeling lost or confused or sad or hurt, or grieving for other people, like to really use that to cry out to God and ask him to intervene in us and in the world around us and know that he's listening and know that he cares and know that he has a plan in it all. And that this would be something that, that shapes our character and grows our faith and trust in him and in his work, even when life seems more chaotic than maybe ever. Yes. Great word. I mean, with, with, with new obstacles come new opportunities to be more like Christ, to grow more like <laughs> Christ. And 
I mean, it's kind of like, I always go back to exercise metaphors, you know, cause I'm a soccer coach and, uh, but you know, you have to, if you do the same thing all the time, you, your, your muscles get comfortable and it's when you mix it up and have new, uh, new workouts or new experiences that you really grow as a, as a, as a person. Um, and so, yeah, Tony, I love that. That's a good, good reminder for us. Amen. Doug, anything else? No, just uh, appreciated your message, just in, encouraging folks to, you know, go back and watch. We had some folks in our life group last night going, yeah, I'm going to watch it again. That was, that was a good word. Oh, so yeah, I, you got a, you covered a lot of territory, even though you, you never, you never actually read the passage, Ty. <laughs> I didn't, you know, Doug, that's a great reminder. Why don't I close us out reading the passage, huh? <laughs> so you going to do it? Sure. Yeah. Let's see here. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Mm -hmm. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Well, thanks, Doug. Thanks for that reminder. You're welcome. <laughs> well, hey, you guys, thanks for all that you're doing at River Valley. You two touch so many lives. Uh, with the people you counsel and, and guide and, and do life with. So thanks for all that you guys are doing. Yeah, You're thanks welcome. for letting us. <laughs> Our yeah, pleasure. Totally. And, uh, you know, for all of you listening and watching, uh, we are excited to hopefully start services, like official live services on June 14th. We'll still be doing a watch party June 7th, but uh, we are hoping, praying that we'll be able to get back to some sort of normalcy and togetherness uh, as soon as possible. So we'll pray for that end and uh, God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.